Hello, I'm Steve Nunn, President and CEO of The Open Group. Welcome to Toolkit Tuesday, where we highlight the various components and leading experts of the Architects Toolkit, a collated portfolio of the most pertinent technology standards for enterprise architects. During the series, I'll be calling on a number of recognized experts who will bring their particular insights on how to most effectively use the various tools in the Architects Toolkit. We'll have a mix of interviews, panel sessions, and pre-recorded presentations along the way. While all standards of the Open Group are designed so they can be adopted independently of one another, the greatest value for an organization can be derived when they're used in unison. The sum of the parts should be greater than the whole. In the Architects Toolkit, we have collated a portfolio of the most pertinent ones for architects together, all in one place. For most of these tools, Certification from the Open Group is also available, so practitioners can demonstrate that they have the skills required and recruiters can take the guesswork out of the recruitment process, all backed up by our Open Badges program. So, unlike in the Alanis Morissette song, in which she describes various things as ironic, it, where none of them actually are, <laughs> sorry Alanis, rain on your wedding day isn't irony. I am finding plenty of irony in the fact that Gen AI, which can generate new content for us as humans, thereby saving us all the effort, has in fact created a whole load of new viewpoints, documents, and look what I made with AI type posts from humans. Hmm. Even worse, this saving of that effort has in practice increased the amount of reading and or filtering the effort I'm putting in as a human to all of this newly generated Gen AI and humans talking about Gen AI output. So what architecturally? Well, we're generating material we won't consume ever. That's poor process design and a business architecture concern. And just like that aforementioned song, we as humans often don't share a common understanding of something. If we place that into an AI model, that is information architecture concern. And now I've created even more content without Gen AI about Gen AI that has generated more work for us. Isn't that ironic, don't you think? Thank you, Paul. Um, welcome everybody to Toolkit Tuesday. Um, uh, great, uh, uh, great thought-provoking minute there from Paul Homan of of IBM. Uh, those of you who are regulars on Toolkit Tuesday will be familiar with Paul's face and his thoughts, um, and uh, a great one there to have us all thinking. Um, so thank you very much, Paul, and thank you all for joining us wherever you are in the world. Um, it's great to have you with us. Um, we love the fact that uh, you take time out of your day and some of you may be um, actually listening to a recording of this which is which is great too whatever um, is convenient for you but uh, we'd love to get the uh, we'd love to be able to share the content that we have here at Toolkit Tuesday with you all um, so for those of you who are joining us uh, live um, just one housekeeping item if you have a question for today's speaker um, or speakers we do have a um, uh, second speaker joining us later in the uh, in the session, then do um, please ask those through the Q&A channel rather than the chat channel. Um, the Q&A channel you can find uh, in the, if you click on the three dots in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, that'll give you the chance to click on Q&A and please uh, ask questions there. But please do use the chat channel um, for communicating with other attendees here uh, at the event. And uh, uh, in particular, please do share where you're joining us from today. Where in the world are you joining us from? Our speakers today are joining us from, from India, so it's a very different time zone where they are than where I am here in California. But uh, we, uh, we tend to spend a lot of time zones and a lot of geographies. So let us know where you are. Um, we'd love to, uh, love to hear that. Well, without, uh, without further ado, we'll move to today's uh, main event. And uh, to set a little context, we'll hear a bit more about them later, but um, the Open Group um, has uh, an awards um, uh, a presentation each year um, for the for the last couple of years. Um, in fact, we've done several now. Uh, I lose track. But uh, very high quality um, submissions. And um, my colleague uh, Palab Sahar will tell us more about that later. But one of the um, key um, uh, submissions this year is from India Railways, which is a uh, very large organization, the largest civil uh, employer in India. And um, it, it's a, an, an organization which we'll hear about has uh, has really adopted 
uh, an enterprise architecture uh, approach and boundaryless information flow, our, our vision here at the Open Group is very relevant to it. So, so to tell us more about the um, Pravar uh, API gateway here at, uh, or, or at Indian Railways, uh, we're joined today by uh, Mr. Sharath Martur, who is the general manager for the Center for Railway Information Systems. And uh, he is an IT specialist with extensive experience of working in railway logistics and the manufacturing sector, skilled in enterprise architecture, IT strategy, business process improvement, and IT in supply chain management. So a warm welcome to Toolkit Tuesday, please, for Mr. Sharat Matur. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And I'm privileged to be here uh, in front of such a diverse audience. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Without much ado, I will just share my screen. I would like to tell you about our uh, enterprise architecture effort and in particular our API gateway that we call Prava. Prava means flow in, in, in Hindi. Uh, and uh, we, we call it Prava because it provides us with the means to have boundaryless information flow across our large organization as well as the ecosystem in which uh, the Indian Railways uh, is embedded. As had been mentioned, Indian Railways is a large organization. It is one of the largest railways in the world, 68,000 kilometers uh, route length, which is uh, quite large, uh, 7,300 stations. We run many passenger trains. We run a large number of freight trains too. We are a mixed railway. We have many rail vehicles, lo locomotives, passenger coaches, and freight wagons. We carry a lot of passenger traffic. Uh, typically, uh, before pre-COVID, the year before COVID, we carried almost 8,500 million passengers. That means uh, individual passenger journeys. So, which was, as you can see, even more than the population of the whole planet. So, this was people who travel regularly by train, and many of them travel every day of their lives on the Indian railway system. We carry about 1,500, 1,500 million tons of freight also. And our annual revenue is about, um, it is approximate is 2.2 trillion rupees, which translates into around 27.5 billion USD. And it is approximately the size, a little bit more than what uh, BNSF railway in the United States is. So it is approximately that size. We are a very manpower intensive operation. So we have uh, almost 1.2 million employees. So it's a large organization in all respects. As I had uh, mentioned, uh, so I just, just to, so there, there's a large number of operations also. I mean, it is a vertically integrated, horizontally integrated uh, enterprise right now. Because apart from the service element, the passenger services and the freight services, uh, and managing passenger and freight terminals, that is uh, the passenger stations and freight loading and unloading facilities. Then we also run the trains, the core train operations. As I said, it's a mixed uh, train operation. So freight and passenger both share the same tracks and therefore the operation is a little complex because they are uh, passenger trains which are run to a schedule and there are freight trains which uh, run when there are paths available to them. There is fixed infrastructure to manage. Rolling stock refers to the rail vehicles. And at the bottom, as you can see, human resources, the financial part, and all the materials that are required to make it run. So there are a large number of uh, interrelated operations to make this whole elephant dance, so to say. So why did we go in for an enterprise architecture? The reason was that our IT 
environment, our IT landscape had become very complex. It was difficult to ensure that interrelated operations, interrelated related processes were properly automated. And it was almost impossible to manage without information systems in place because of the increasing traffic and the room for any, the, the cushion to run this system was becoming less. And so we had come up with a very large number of IT applications. And the purpose of this whole enterprise architecture exercise was to align the IT with the business priorities. So therefore, the process, which is the, the standard process we followed, we followed the TOGAF standard. We, uh, India has developed its own India enterprise architecture framework, which is based on TOGAF, extends the TOGAF uh, framework with reference models, which are related to integration, to security, to performance. So it is an extended TOGAF standard, but the process, the architecture development method is similar. So we did our best to tailor the architecture to our needs and then to follow the ADM uh, stand, uh, the steps so that we had a very cohesive and coordinated approach to developing our enterprise architecture. We are still on the way. We have uh, completed some part of it. We are still on the way to completing the rest of the enterprise architecture effort. And as we all know, it is a never ending story. It never ends. You have to manage and govern the architecture. So to align IT with business uh, priorities, and then of course, to envision our future requirements, create the target state, ascertain the current state of the enterprise and identify gaps in information systems. And then to ensure that we get a practical realization, we create a set of work packages to move from this uh, standard state to the target state and the work packages we inject into our existing project management system. That has been our endeavor in this, uh, in this effort. So if you look at the priorities that Indian Railways has today, there are around five drivers. So there are five drivers that we have identified, growth and sustainability, safer and more secure travel, participation in the national logistics and travel ecosystem. This has emerged recently as one of the very, very critical needs of the railways to be able to participate in the ecosystems so that especially the logistics ecosystem, because bringing down the cost of logistics is the avowed aim of the government because it brings in efficiencies into uh, all processes improves uh, the way you function and of course a better customer experience and efficient operations so now i am just going to uh, concentrate on the participation in national logistics and travel ecosystems that was one of the drivers of this whole effort and now we are partnering increasingly we find that there has to be boundaryless information flow across organizational boundaries. And so we have started to overtly uh, engage our partner organizations and our partner organizations are our customers. As you can see here on this screen, you can see some of what goes for our partners. They are aggregators, surface transporters, warehouses, companies who are uh, managing warehouses on the track side, terminals. We also allow uh, private uh, and other organizations to own wagons. And these partners are all now we want to serve them through information systems and interchanging information with them where they don't have to put in any effort on their side. Their IT systems can talk to our IT systems. That is the idea. Same in the, in the partner uh, space, the partner space, I mean, uh, passenger travel. So transporters like airlines, bus services, metro systems, hospitality industry, travel facilitators, online travel portals, travel agents, and of course, government, tourism ministry, health ministry, security agencies. With all of these, we increasingly have a tie up for interchange of information. 
and we had envisaged that this would be part of our uh, enabling infrastructure for our enterprise architecture when we want to realize the architecture that we reach. So this was an enabling system that we wanted to set up, put in place, so that when our architecture got developed to a certain extent and we were ready for interchanging information with our partner organizations, we would have the means to do so and we wouldn't start at that time. So we built our API uh, management system and API gateway to ensure that we were able to meet that need. So we have put in Prava. Prava is an API gateway and management system, benefits for Indian railways, seamless flow of information with our partners. So for us, it is beneficial. And transactions are secure. We know who is logging into or who is transacting with our systems. We can manage transaction volumes. This was a problem. What used to happen was uh, when we were ticketing, then at that time, there were some peak times. At peak times, our systems used to get bogged down because there were so many transactions. And at uh, lean times, they were idling. So uh, once you put uh, uh, an API gateway in place, you can control the transactions that are moving to the backend. So we use that extensively for rate limiting and throttling. And of course, our partners uh, get a standardized interface. We are able to offer standardized APIs for our partners and the partners can consume them. And we also increasingly our mobile apps. We decouple the front end from the back end by putting uh, the transactions, running them through the API gateway. Partners, of course, benefit. They, they, they get, uh, sorry, uh, they, they, they get uh, easy to understand API logic. The user interface is decoupled from the back end. They can make their own front ends if they so desire. Uh, their IT systems can connect to our IT systems. And slowly a third party develop ecosystem will also um, emerge. We, we are expecting that to happen soon, as soon as we move a little bit down the down this line. So how does it work? Indian Railways, Chris, that is the Center for Railway Information Systems, which is us, the IT arms of uh, IT arm of the Indian Railways. We have our backend systems and we publish APIs through our API management system. Our partners can come through IoT devices, they can have apps, they can have web applications, they can have mobile apps, and all of them can connect to the API management system. So it is a controlled environment in which the information flows. Our benefit is that we offer uh, our services and uh, our customers can selectively select the services that they want to access. And then by consuming those particular APIs, they can access the services. We started in August 21. And by now we are running about 13 million API calls per month. This, is, this has been the level of uh, transactions for the last few months, around 12 to 13 million. Now, this month, we have also added a couple of more front end applications. Uh, we, what we call a uh, 139 service. We have a single uh, telephone number. So there is a 139 service. So on that 139 service, now we also have a mobile app. We also have web applications coming in. So that recently we have connected and uh, that has gone live a couple of days back. So with that, perhaps the number of API calls will increase even more. And uh, as you can see, 141 published APIs are being accessed. Government of India has a citizen portal, a mobile app that allows them to access all different government of India services. So that Umang app is also integrated. The good part was through the API gateway, we could do it in less than a month. So in summary, APIs are a powerful catalyst for digital transformation. They are a powerful catalyst for ensuring boundaryless information flow across ecosystems like uh, we are trying to create in India, the logistics and travel ecosystems. It encourages API providers and consumers to collaborate. Customers get rich customer experiences and new digital channels come up, internal and external for data sharing, enabling mobile applications, perhaps even 
monetizing the information and data. We haven't started doing that, but at some point of time, perhaps we will be able to use those opportunities. And the API management system provides us the setup to manage APIs and ensure that we keep improving our services since we can measure what we are offering. Thank you very much. Uh, that is uh, how we how we are managing and that is how our API system is running right now. I'd like to thank you all very much for taking the patience for listening to me. Thank you. Sure, thank you very much indeed. That's uh, an awful lot of work described in a small number of minutes. So uh, a great summary, thank you. And um, thank you. Uh, I've got a, a question or two for you, which I'll, I'll ask shortly, but um, I mentioned at the, uh, at the introduction to the session today that uh, this was uh, um, in the context, we were doing this in the context of the Open Group India Awards, which are coming up. So um, just to say a few, uh, a few words about those, I'd like to uh, introduce or reintroduce to many of you, uh, my colleague, Dr. Palab Saha, who's the General Manager for India for the Open Group. And um, he is a uh, Mayati NEGD senior lead expert in enterprise architecture and visiting professor of digital architecture at the Indian Institute of Management. And he advises various ministries and states on matters pertaining to government wide architecture initiatives. So uh, welcome back, Pala. Please tell us a little more about the awards. Steve, uh, good day to all of you. And First of all, I'd like to thank Sharat for, uh, you know, taking us briefly taking us through this wonderful journey of a very large and complex organization, uh, Indian Railways, and it's, uh, you know, and how it forms a backbone for the country, right? So that's very important from a, from an architecture point of view. Now, as, uh, you know, as uh, Steve was alluding to, this is, I would say this, this project was one of the nominations that we received in the India Awards 2022. So we have an annual award, which is called the Open Group India Awards for Innovation and Excellence, where we encourage organizations to use open standards and open source, right? And as you saw in this presentation today, this is based on the adoption of India Enterprise Architecture Framework, which is based on TOGAF. Today, Sharad did not show, but uh, you, you know, I'm aware of this project for a fairly long um, you know, period of time. and. Uh, Indian Railways can also be classified as a power user of Archimate, one of our other standards. And you will see the wonderful Archimate models they use to manage the entire specification, the entire uh, entire blueprint, if you will, and all the models that they create. So the India Awards is something that we run every year. This year, the uh, awards ceremony is scheduled on 27th of July, 5 p.m. India time. It is going to be an online uh, ceremony. Uh, and we do have multiple categories for the India Awards, and the most important one, of course, comes uh, in terms of the number of nominations we receive pertains to enterprise architecture. So that's one of the categories. The other categories we have uh, is IT for IT, which focuses on IT planning and management. Then we have a category covering cybersecurity, supply chain security, trusted provider standards, which aligns to the OTTPS, then we have another one for zero trust architecture. Then we have a category covering for the end, uh, energy industry, which is the open source software data platform. And finally, this year we have introduced a new category, which is women enterprise architects. We would like to encourage women architects. And I know that in the industry, we don't have too many women architects. So one of our endeavor in this 2023 edition of the award is to identify and honor organizations who have put together programs to nurture and groom women architects. So in a nutshell, what I'd like to do is invite all of you to watch the, uh, you know, the award ceremony and see who the winners are, because all of the winners will tell you how they have adopted our standards in improving and bringing transformation in their respective organizations. So look forward to your participation and over to you, Steve. Thank you very much, Pat. That's a great, uh, great summary. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing some of the, uh, uh, well, seeing the award ceremony, but uh, hearing more in detail about some of the awards. I know there's been uh, uh, quite a review going on so far. Um, and uh, last year, I remember being being really quite struck by uh, some of the great um, 
the great ways in which our standards were being used um, uh, to really make a difference across all sorts of industries. And we expect the same uh, again here. And uh, obviously today we heard an example of that um, in Indian railways. So if I can switch back to uh, uh, to you, Shiraz, a, a, a question. Um, when you, that, that, that's come in here, um, when you obviously put a gateway in to so much um gateways could potentially be a restrictor for um for the flow of information rather than an enabler so have you found have you ever found that 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 um that the capacity isn't there for example or has this overall just just helped you you did mention throttling and uh, etc and cloud based um, activities so has it been uh, has it ever been an impediment rather than than an enabler well, this uh, this question haunts us uh, continuously uh, because you know if, if if the enabler becomes an impediment, then you are in real trouble. So, uh, well, so far it hasn't. We were it was a little difficult to size this uh, gateway, but so far uh, after going through a number of cycles, we decided upon a figure of 1000 transactions per second. And so far we have not hit that. However, there are a couple of caveats because some of our very high value, uh, I mean, high transaction, uh, um, uh, you know, interactions where the transactions are very picky. For example, for our uh, ticketing, when tickets open, we have a, a, a 180 day window for tickets. So in some very popular trains during holidays, there's a sudden spike in ticketing. So for those transactions, actually, we have not brought them onto the only that one or two transactions. We have not brought them onto the API gateway, although now we are screwing up the courage to do that. But we feel that perhaps we'll be able to manage those also. However, we have made this scalable so that in case there is a, uh, we find a restriction, then we can quickly scale up. We can buy additional licenses very quickly under the same agreement and then scale it up. So, so far, uh, we are just hoping that we can do it in a planned way. So far, so good. Great, great. And the, 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 the second and last question I'll, I'll ask you, Surat, it's, it's almost the, uh, the flip side of that coin um, in the sense of security. Obviously, with, with such a valuable gateway and such a, such a lot of information resting behind it, um, has that been ha, has that been an issue, or can you speak to some of the um, uh, general approach to security that you've taken in connection with the gateway? Well, of course, uh, that is a very pertinent question because uh, these uh, API gateways and management systems are magnets for all types of malicious code, and they are a very large attack surface for malicious players again. Because they know that all the transactions are going, if they co compromise the gateway, then, then they have a large number of backends under their control. So what we have done is that we have tried to be as careful as possible during the installation and implementation process. So what we, so only our public facing part of the gateway where the uh, requests land, those are in our DMZ, in our demilitarized zone, but the key manager the uh, actual proper uh, gateway uh, uh, part, the, the actually the gateway manager part, all that is in the military zone so that it is kept secure. And uh, we have our security team constantly doing security reviews and ensuring. But there is another uh, thing that can uh, that happens here is that the Transactions that go through this, we have to always keep talking to the backend system uh, system administrators and their developers to ensure that their transactions are inherently secure. Otherwise, with the best security on the gateway, if the transactions, if the backend systems are poorly written, then uh, malicious software can even then get through. So you have to be a little careful. Of course, of course. Um, and I do have, uh, we, are, we are out of time, but I do have a couple of questions that just come in. Um, that you may or may not be able to answer um, and uh, don't feel pressure to if it's inappropriate. But uh, one is, um, what is your API gateway software? And the other is, do you have the liberty to share what database management system you're using? But 
Uh, yes, I mean, we are, uh, API management system is based on WSO2. And at the back end, we are using a standard RDBMS. So, um, and we have uh, installed it right now on our own setup in our own, we have a private cloud. So we have installed it in the private cloud, but we are looking for ways to migrate it to the public cloud at some point of time. Great. Thank you for taking those. Um, and uh, thank you for uh, coming here and sharing today um, and um, and uh, for your words about the awards as well, Palap. So uh, uh, a big thank you, please, to uh, Sharaf Matur and uh, Dr. Palap Saha. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. So, thank um, you, that is uh, it for today's uh, topic, but please join us in two weeks' time, uh, which is uh, Tuesday, July the 11th, where we will have a... Um, a presentation on something that's, that's dear to my heart and uh, probably many of you, the benefits of the TOGAF standard um, from uh, Rita Sundari and Samuel Bandaru of Architects. So uh, please join us in two weeks time at Toolkit Tuesday. Meanwhile, wherever you are in the world, please keep safe and well and thank you for your time today. I'm Steve Nunn. This was Toolkit Tuesday. <laughs>